Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us um, on this Saturday morning. Um, welcome to the second of two online seminars that MD UK is holding this morning as part of our Muscles Matter online seminar series, Living with a Muscle Wasting Condition in 2020 and Beyond. This is the first um, uh, two series that we've done, sorry, two seminars that we've done on a Saturday morning. So you'll have to forgive some of the panel, including myself, may have some uh, background noise um, from, from family in the house, but bear with us. Um, we, in this series of 12 seminars, we're exploring living with a muscle wasting condition and six of them are exploring specific conditions and those are aligned to awareness days, weeks and months. And the remaining six are looking at a range of topics relevant to anyone affected by a muscle wasting condition. So in the series so far, we've explored spinal muscular atrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, mitochondrial disease, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, living in a world with COVID-19, assisted and accessible tech, education and employment. And earlier today, we explored Becker muscular dystrophy. And in this session, of course, we're exploring financial support. There are two further seminars after today, um, exploring charcoal marry tooth uh, disease and then the impact of COVID-19 on neuromuscular services. And the link to go to if you want to book either of those two sessions or view the previous sessions I mentioned, which are all now, all now available as recordings, um, should be on the screen now. MD UK is holding these seminars uh, because for now we're not able to bring our community together through our information days, our family fun days, our national conferences, or indeed our muscle groups. And um, I think it's important though to note that our helpline remains available and we're going to provide some more information about that as we move into the, the presentation shortly. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's supported our work through um, volunteering their time or by making a donation. We're hugely indebted to everyone who's helped us to ensure that we can continue to deliver sessions like today and activity like this. Uh, and there's a vast ar array of ways in which you can get involved with MD UK. So do please get in touch or jump on our website if you want to know more about volunteering with us um, or making a donation. Um, so moving on to the practicalities of this morning's session. Um, we've had a few questions in advance, which has been fantastic. And we're keen to um, make this um, a kind of live session as well and incorporate some, some live questions that, that may come up. And to do this, we'll be using the Q&A function. So at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A um, button. Please type your question or comment in there um, and I'll feed them into the discussion or conversation. Um, so to help us manage the technical side of the event, we won't be calling on questioners to ask their questions directly. Um, and any questions we don't manage to cover or that we don't know the answers to, we'll seek to answer through our website afterwards. Um, and our final um, reminder before we kick off in earnest is that we're recording the session of course uh, and that's and that this will be made available later this week once we've finished. So I'm going to hand over to our, our panel now so this is a rare a rare one for in the series and it's mainly um, MD UK colleagues so I'm delighted that um, Neeru, Beth uh, and Jackie have, have joined us so they're going to start by um, giving us a sort of presentation of some of the sort of key areas of financial support that may be available I'm then delighted that we're joined by Mark Hall, um, who is one of our peer support volunteers who's living with um, Becker muscular dystrophy. Uh, Mark worked in local government for over 25 years and is now semi-retired. And he's been a peer support volunteer since the network began in 2014. So thank you so much for, for that, Mark. Um, in, in most recently, Mark supported an individual over the phone to fill in her, her PIP form, personal independence payment form, giving guidance and tips and speaking her through her his, his, his experience. And that's a really good example of the way in which our peer support volunteers support people. But Mark will, will say more about that later after the presentation. So I think I'm handing straight over um, to Nero. So without further ado, Nero, over to you and the team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Um, can we go on to the next slide, please? Good morning, everyone. It's good to see so many of you here today. Um, I'm going to be covering quick, giving you a quick overview of some of the support we can provide, both financial and practical. And then this session will focus on the financial side of things, as navigating financial and practical support can be a really daunting experience sometimes. And we are always here to help you. Um, so we have a helpline that's open Monday to Friday at the moment from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, we may in November, once we have all staff back from furlough, extend this time. So I would just check our website for that. 
Um, so we're able to provide um, advice and information over the phone regarding practical support. We we are here to answer your questions that you may have. And if you're a, and we're, if we're not able to answer your questions, we will signpost you to an organisation that will be able to support you. Um, we've also got lots of publications and resources available, which at the moment we're emailing out links to, but hopefully once the offices open up in the near future, we can start posting those out as well. And these include condition specific fact sheets, they include alert cards, we have PIP guides, and we have various adaptation and education manuals that can support you when navigating the system. Um, We've been and will continue providing support through this difficult time with COVID at the moment, though we do have some reduced capacity, so do bear with us, as 60% of our staff are still on furlough. We've already responded from April this year and through the COVID pandemic with 980 helpline calls and emails, so that's a fantastic number for us at the moment. And we are still able to provide support, which is great positive. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So what I wanted to touch on, and that's where Mark would come in as well, is our peer support network that he's also a part of. So we have 50 volunteers who either have a muscle wasting condition themselves or have a relative or partner with a condition. And our peer support volunteers come with various life experiences with their conditions. They cover multiple conditions and they're located across the UK and they're able to provide support and share their experiences with their journey through their journey that they've had with you which is vitally important we and the feedback we receive is always positive so we've got we've made since January of this year about peer, 40 peer support link ups um, in January, since January 2020 and the support that our volunteers surprise is so sorry, mixed my words there. They usually provide support, not face-to-face, -face, it's usually over the phone or by email. Um, and most recently, since the coronavirus outbreak, our peer support volunteers have been providing further support by helping people fill in those initial application forms for PIP and DLA. And I think going forward, we'll sort of expand in that area to give them some more um, experiences and training to deal with things like that further. And there's a great picture on this slide. It's of a peer support training day held in last October with 10 of our new peer support volunteers. So we are hoping to carry out more of these as time goes on. Um, and then if we move on to the next slide, please. So um, now if we move on to our advocacy service, we've got three advocacy officers based in the devolved nations. And then we have two advocacy officers based at our head office in London. And they all support individuals with neuromuscular conditions living across the country. Um, they've all had experience in supporting people with muscle wasting conditions. And their role is to support people to access the, the um, financial and practical support they're entitled to. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, so what issues, so I wanted to now just very quickly touch on the issues that come through and what we support with. So a lot of the issues are financial ones, so PIP, DLA, universal credit, and this is where this presentation will focus on these, and Beth and Jackie will give you some more information on that. We do also support with other things. We support with care packages, both social and continuing health care. We support with education, so education health plans etc um, and in terms of employment we do look at the financial side of things through universal credit but and um, employment support allowance but we also provide advice and support when you're trying to access the access to work scheme so they can make reasonable adjustments for you also we have occasions where people are trying to access equipment through their local authority so wheelchairs beds hoists we support with that area as well housing housing adaptations blue badges transport schemes so we do provide 
support with a whole host of topics. So if you do ever have any questions, do just pick up the phone and call our helpline. Um, next slide, please. So there is a process of accessing um, advocacy support. You can either call our helpline as a starting point or our email inbox, which is info at musculodystrophyuk.org. Um, and then in order to access the service, you need to sign a consent form, which we can email or post out to you. Once this is returned to us, a caseworker will be allocated with your case and they'll contact you for more information. And then depending on what support you require, we can support with appeals against unfair decisions, we can write letters to relevant statutory services and represent your views and concerns. Um, and um, that will cover all the topics that I've mentioned previously. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? So in terms of accessing financial support, the topics that this presentation is gonna cover is PIP, Universal Credit, ESA, Attendance and Support Allowance, and DLA. Um, these are a combination of means and non-means tested benefits. Um, and what means tested means is that they will check what other income you have coming in if it is a means tested benefit. Um, the benefits that we will focus on, like I said, is PIP, DLA, ESA and universal credit. Can we just move on to my final slide, please? Um, and then I did mention that we support with other practical areas of support. So this slide is just giving you a brief overview of what support is available. So we support with applications for social housing, moving you up on the housing reg register so you're higher priority. Um, and we support with applications for dis disability facilities grants for housing adaptations to suit your needs at the time where you need them. Um, this grant for major adaptations, and this can be grants for major adaptations, such as through floor lifts, wet rooms, moving a room to a downstairs location, etc. And then we also provide support with care packages. And we have found that we get more and more queries about care packages as people are struggling with social services and continuing health care. And the thing to bear in mind with care packages are social care packages are means tested sometimes, but continuing health care isn't. Um, I think now I have covered all the support that we do provide, but like I say, just always pick up the phone, drop us an email. We are always here to help you. I'm now going to hand over to Beth Tingley, who's our advocacy and support officer based at head office to continue the presentation and give you a bit more information. Thank you. Thanks, Harry, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, it wouldn't be funny if I wasn't going to talk about coronavirus in this presentation. Um, and unfortunately, the pandemic has affected benefits. Um, so the DWP have postponed all face-to-face -face medical assessments at the moment, um, and they're carrying out telephone assessments instead. Um, there is kind of some leeway. If you're not comfortable with speaking over the phone, or you find that your condition affects your speech, um, then please do let the DWP know. They can assess you by looking at your application form and medical evidence um, or you can have another person on the call with you um, and they can take part in discussions and notes. Um, you also now have a longer amount of time to return your application form. Um, so for example with PIP you only used to have 28 days to return the form um, which is quite a short amount of time given that the form's so long um, and you also need to acquire all of your um, further evidence letters from from healthcare professionals. Um, so now you do have three months and um, that's been extended. Um, however, in turn, the DWP are also taking longer to process applications. So also award lengths have been automatically extended by six months. Um, so from March to July this year, kind of in the height of the pandemic, um, benefit reviews and reassessments weren't carried out by the DWP um, due to the pandemic. Um, so there's now a backlog of reviews for the DWP to process. 
So if your benefit award is due to expire, for example, next month in November, um, your review will not be carried out um, until for a further six months. And this is the case for all benefits with an end date. Um, so for example, PIP, DLA, attendance allowance. Um, and the DWP should write to you to tell you that your end date has changed. So they should confirm it in a letter. Um, and lastly, tribunal hearings are now either paper hearings or over the phone. Um, so at the moment, a judge will assess your case based on the documents you have submitted. Um, the judge will then send you a provisional decision. And if you disagree with this, this decision, you can ask for a hearing over the phone um, or a video conference call. So there's kind of some pros and cons, I think, to the changes that have been kind of implemented due to coronavirus. Some things will be probably quite helpful um, and others maybe not so. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So the first benefit I'm gonna be speaking about today is personal independence payments. Um, so PIP is a non-means tested benefit. Um, so it doesn't take into any account, uh, any of your income into account or savings. Um, and it's available for people aged between 16 and 65, um, so the current state pension age. Um, PIP is available to support people with the additional cost of living with a long-term health condition or disability, such as muscle wasting conditions. Um, and the amount of money you receive depends on how your condition affects you under the two components of PIP. Um, so there's the daily living component and also the mobility component. So as some of you may be aware, um, DLA for adults, which is disability living allowance, um, it's currently being phased out and replaced by PIP. Um, so if you are currently still receiving DLA, um, you will eventually need to apply for PIP, um, but only when you've been asked to by the Department for Work and Pensions. So they'll write to you and ask you to transfer over from DLA to PIP, make an initial application. Um, and obviously we can support with that transition um, and help you apply for PIP. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so the daily living component of PIP looks at if you have any difficulties with washing and bathing, dressing and undressing, preparing food, taking nutrition and so forth. There are quite a few different descriptors um, that they ask you about. Um, and the mobility component looks at if you have any difficulties with walking, if you use any aids to support you when walking um, and if you experience any falls. So you can be awarded one or both of the components. Um, so you can be awarded just the care component, just the mobility component or both of the com components. Um, and you can be awarded PIP at the standard rate or enhanced rate. So it just has a different uh, monetary value. Um, so you'll need to get eight points to be awarded the standard rate and 12 points to be awarded the enhanced rate. Um, and you will be awarded PIP for a set amount of time, um, as I mentioned on the couple of slides ago. Um, so, for example, you'll be awarded it for three or four years um, and you'll then be reassessed. Always in our supporting letters, we try to highlight, you know, that muscle wasting conditions are progressive um, and that we wouldn't expect people to be reassessed so soon as, as three or four years. So we will always try um, to get you a extended award length. Um, I think you can get a lifetime award or 10 years before you're reassessed. So we will always try to push for that because... Um, we know it's not nice to kind of go have reviews every every three years. It's quite off, uh, soon. Um, and this is the same with most benefits that we'll be talking about today. They, they always kind of have end dates to them. Um, that's fine. So next slide, please. Um, so this is a little uh, chart, <laughs> which is the, uh, showing the current process for applying for PIP. Um, so firstly, you would need to call the PIP application line. Um, so the number um, you can find online easily um, and then the DWP will then post you a, a application form. This form is called how your disability affects you um, and we can support with filling out this form over the phone um, or like Neeru said one of our peer support volunteers um, who have experience with PIP are able to help with filling it out as well over the phone. Um, so you'll then have around three months to complete this form and post it back to them. Um, and we always advise when you're posting back your PIP, 
hip form um, to include any kind of supporting evidence from your neuromuscular team. Um, so if you've got a care advisor, neurologist, physiotherapist, it's always a really good idea just to ask if they can write a letter in support of your PIP application as well, um, just explaining your condition and how it affects you. Um, and obviously, of course, our supporting letter as well, you can send off. Um, so after you've submitted your form, um, it's likely you'll receive an appointment for an assessment with a healthcare professional. Um, so usually the DWP will use Capita, um, so they're kind of linked in with them and it will be a healthcare professional. Um, but as previously mentioned, all face-to-face -face assessments have uh, been stopped due to the pandemic. Um, so your assessment for PIP will be carried out over the phone. And then the DWP will notify you of their decision um, following your telephone assessment within three months. Um, and as with all benefits that we're going to be talking about today in this presentation, um, there are two stages of appealing if you disagree with the decision. Um, so I think Jackie's going to talk about that a bit later, how to appeal a benefits decision. Next slide, please. Um, so we understand that muscle wasting conditions are extremely rare um, and that many healthcare professionals and assessors will have not come across them before. Um, and that's why we're here really to support you um, to kind of navigate this process. Um, so we also have put together, I've got one with me, you can see that, I can't see myself. <laughs> um, so we put together a comprehensive guide about PIP to support you through the process. Um, so from applying to appealing a PIP decision, um, so it's quite a comprehensive guide. Um, and it also goes through all of the questions on the PIP form as well. Um, so that can be quite helpful when filling out your PIP form. Um, so if you'd like a copy, then do just email um, or call us because we do have like a small stock at home, um, which we can send out or it is on, on our website as well. So we could email you the link if that's better. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so moving on to disability living allowance. Um, so DLA is also non-means tested, so it doesn't take into account any of your income or savings. Um, and it's available for children aged 0 to 16 years old. Um, and it's, it's available for the recognised additional cost of living with a disability. So DLA looks at if your child has any difficulties with walking um, or if they require additional care and attention than a child of the same age who does not have a condition. Next slide, please. Um, so there are two components under DLA. So it's quite similar to PIP in that respect. Um, there's the care component and the mobility component. Um, and the amount of money you receive depends on your care and mobility needs. Um, so DLA is paid at a low, middle or high rate for the care component. Um, and the care component looks at how much support and supervision your child requires throughout the day and or the night. Um, and then DLA is paid at a lower or higher rate for the mobility component. So, and the mobility component looks at how your child's condition affects their ability to walk um, and if they experience any difficulties when walking. Um, and it's also important to note that the mobility component is only available to children aged three years and over. Next slide, please. OK, so lastly, um, this is the current process for applying for DLA. Um, so first, you need to call the National Application Line um, or the DLA form is actually available on the government website as well. Um, so you can print it off from their website or you can fill it in online. Um, and then I think as you fill it in online, you can save it as well and then go back to it. So that's quite helpful. Um, and also with DLA, there's no kind of time limit for you to send back your application form, unlike PIP, which there is. Um, so that can also be quite helpful. It gives you kind of time to fill out the form, gather all your supporting evidence. Um, so, yeah, you complete the form um, with support from us um, or your local systems advice can also support you to fill out the form um, and post it back to the DWP. Um, so then the DWP will notify you of their decision. Um, and unlike PIP, there isn't actually a medical assessment for DLA, um, so it, it won't be over the phone or there was never a face to face assessment to begin with. Um, it's purely form based. Um, so it's really, really important that you submit supporting evidence from your child's neuromuscular team um, or any healthcare involved in their care. 
just so they get a really good understanding of your child's condition, how it affects them, um, because they won't meet your child to assess them. Um, and of course, we're also able to provide a supporting letter. Um, so that's me done. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Jackie, um, who's going to be speaking about employment support allowance, universal credit and how to challenge a benefits decision. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Jackie, I'm the Advocacy and Information Officer that's based in Scotland and the next benefit that I'm going to be talking about is Employment and Support Allowance. Um, so I'll, I'll refer to that as ESA just, just for ease um, throughout this as well. Um, so ESA is a benefit that you can apply for if you have a disability or a long-term health condition that affects your ability to work or how often you can work, um, for example how many hours a week. Um, so it's a fortnightly payment and you can apply for it if you're under state pension age. Um, so there are now three different types of ESA. Um, so previously there was two, so there's now three. Um, so this is known as new style ESA, contribution based ESA and income related ESA. Which type of ESA you can apply for depends on your income and your national insurance contributions. Um, so ESA can be quite a complex benefit because it's unique to each person's individual circumstances. Um, but the type of ESA that most people claim is new style ESA. Um, so you can claim ESA at the same time as other benefits like personal independence payment and DLA. But you can't usually claim ESA at the same time as other means tested benefits such as job seekers allowance or income support. Um, and just as a separate note, it's important just for us to recognise that universal credits replaced income related ESA for most people. Um, I'll go on to speak about universal credit in a, a little while, um, but if you have any questions about applying for universal credit, do give us a call because we recognise that this is a complex benefit um, and a, a complex process. And again, it's unique to each indiv individual who's applying for that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so when you claim ESA, you'll usually be required to show that you have limited capability for work by attending a work capability assessment or providing medical evidence. Um, so as, as Beth mentioned earlier at the moment, the DWP um, and the government has postponed all face-to-face -face medical assessments. So the DWP will try to assess you without seeing you in person by looking over medical in, uh, evidence and having a conversation with you over the phone. Um, so the work capability assessment has two elements. There's a questionnaire and a medical assessment and they both have to receive 15 points to be eligible for ESA. So following that, you'll be placed in one of two groups um, following the assessment. So that would either be the work-related activity group or the support group. Um, if you're placed in the work-related activity group, that means that you, you aren't able to work currently. However, in the future, you might be expected to return to work. If you're placed in the support group, that means that you can't work at the moment and you're not expected to work in the future. Um, the difference between these two groups is that the work-related activity group means that you would be expected to have ongoing assessment, whereas if you're in the support group, it's recognised that you don't have to do that. So some people can be placed in the wrong group. So it's important to make sure that you, that you feel that you are in the right category for ESA. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is just the process of how to apply for ESA. Um, so to start an ESA application, you would need to call the National Helpline or there is a form that can be downloaded online from the government's website. Um, again, that's something that we can talk you through and support you with. Um, once you've completed the, fo the form, you would usually have a medical assessment over the phone. And if you qualify, it will depend on what stage your application is at, as well as things like your age, your circumstances, and whether you're able to get back into work. Um, you'll normally get the assessment rate for ESA for 13 weeks while your claim has been assessed. And a decision will be made after your medical assessment. And as I mentioned previously, once one, if you're entitled to ESA, you'll be placed into one of the two groups um, that I've, I've just chatted about. Um, just as a side note, if you're in the support group and on income related ESA, you might also be entitled to additional premiums, um, which is known as enhanced disability premium or the severe disability premium as well. Um, next slide, please, Emma. Thank you. 
Um, so finally, I'm just going to um, talk about universal credit. Again, universal credit is quite a complex um, benefit. So it is a means tested benefit um, and it's paid monthly and it's to help with living costs. Um, so you might be able to receive universal credit if you're on low income, um, out of work or if you're unable to work. So universal credit has replaced um, six benefits, which you can see on the slides. Um, and these are now known as legacy benefits. If you currently get any of these benefits, you don't need to do anything unless there's a change in your circumstances, which you need to report, um, or the, DW, the DWP contacts you about moving over to universal credit. So the purpose of introducing universal credit was to simplify a complicated benefit system. Um, as far as we're aware, it's only possible to apply online. Universal credit's digital by default, so it's all done online. Um, so this can present challenges to people depending on individual circumstances. Um, because it's a means tested benefit, you won't receive it um, if you or your partner have more than over 16,000 in savings. Um, and if you live with a partner, you have to make a joint claim as well. Um, so as I mentioned, you receive it through a single monthly payment which is made up of a number of individual payments called elements. And I'll, I'll speak more about that in the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, so everyone who successfully claims for universal credit, credit will receive the standard allowance initially. And the standard allowance rate of payment depends on your circumstances. And as I mentioned, this includes your age or your marital status. Um, you can then qualify for additional elements on top of this, depending on what your situation is. So each element has a monetary value attached to it. So, for example, this could be carers element, um, childcare costs element or limited capability for work. Um, I'll, I'll go on and just chat a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, so your monthly payment would be made up of your standard allowance and any additional elements that you might qualify for. So it does take around five weeks to receive your first payment for universal credit. Um, so if you need help to pay for bills or other costs while you wait for this, you can apply to get an advance. Um, but it's important to recognise that that does need to be paid back over a maximum of 12 months, although it can be delayed for three months when you, you first begin receiving universal credit. Next slide, please. Um, so as a universal credit claimant, you, as I mentioned, you receive the standard allowance. Um, or you can receive the standard allowance plus any of these elements that you might be eligible for as well. Um, so again, depending on your, your circumstances. Um, so next slide, please. So again, this is the application process for applying for universal credit. Um, so the process is all done online. You'll need to create an account and fill out the application form. Um, and you need to submit your claim within 28 days of creating your account. Um, if you aren't able to apply online, you can contact the Universal Credit Helpline who, who might be able to kind of discuss other options with you. Um, when you create an account, you will be allocated a work coach or a case manager who should guide and support you where appropriate. Um, you'll then have an interview over the phone with Job Centre Plus and they will take one month to assess your claim and then they'll notify you of, your, of their decision. So you should then receive your first payment one week after that. Um, it's important to recognise that when you apply for universal credit, other benefits are usually stopped. Um, but there is support available, as I mentioned earlier, in the form of an advance, because they recognise that there's a time delay between benefits being stopped and receiving your first payment. Um, and claimants can use their online account to keep in touch with their work coach, their case manager, to report any changes in circumstances and to keep track of payments. Just the next slide, please. So finally, I'm just going to chat about what happens if you don't get what you're entitled to and how you go about challenging benefit decisions. Um, so there are two stages to appealing a benefit decision. The first stage of appealing is called a mandatory reconsideration and this is when we ask the DWP to internally look at the decision again. Um, at this point you also have the opportunity to send in additional medical evidence um, and that's something that we can support with. Um, so usually when there's a, we ask for a mandatory reconsideration we go through the written feedback from the DWP and we can have a conversation with you and challenge the specific points that you disagree with. Um, and we can chat about what kind of medical evidence and things like that that would go in support of that. 
Um, if you're still unsuccessful and disagree with the decision, then you can appeal the decision and take it to a tribunal. Um, so the tribunal's hearings heard by Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, and they are external to the DWP. You'll be given an appeal, an appeal hearing date, um, where a judge will call you and consider the information relating to your case and decide whether to overturn the DWP's original decision. But at the moment, because of coronavirus, um, a tribunal judge will assess your case without a hearing. Instead, they'll try and make a decision based only on the documents. They'll send you a provisional decision once they've done this. But if you don't agree, you can ask the tribunal for a hearing. Um, and if there has to be a hearing at the moment, it's usually been done via phone call or video conference. So I think we, we mentioned yesterday, we can support at any stage of challenging a financial benefit decision. Um, so if you're yeah, currently in the process of doing that, please get in touch with us. We also recognise that these are really complex systems um, to navigate. So please do give us a call if there's anything that you want to chat about or if you want support going through the process. Thanks, I think that's me finished. Thank you, Jackie, Neera and Beth. That was, that was really um, fantastic presentation and really helpful. I think um, a, lot, a lot of information presented and worth remembering that the helpline is here to, to walk you through all those all those steps if you need so don't feel um overwhelmed by the info definitely give us a ring because we can we can talk you sort of through the, the your specific issue um Neera mentioned as well about the, the the help hours at the moment but if you if you need to contact us but can't call us during those times do let us know and leave a message or an email and one of us can call you back as well so that's that's worth noting um the other thing I'd, I'd sort of remembered as, as you all were talking was um, earlier this year, we um, published a report on the experience of people with muscle wasting conditions accessing the benefit system and that's available on our on our website. Um, and if you're having issues at the moment, you, it may be helpful to know you're definitely not alone. So spoiler alert as to the findings of the report, but the report was called Unfit for Purpose. So I think you'll recognise from that that the fact that we're having to provide so much support means we're, we're also pushing government to make improvements to the to the system along with with many other um ch charities that support people through the the benefit system and um, we've had some questions in already through the q a function which we'll come to shortly so I'd, um do, do please continue to to ask us some questions and we'll come to those shortly before we do that though i'd like to just bring in mark um who as i mentioned earlier one of our original peer support volunteers so first of all mark thanks for sticking with us much appreciated throughout for the last sort of six plus years, I guess, then. Um, Mark, could you just give us a brief overview of the kind of um, role you play in supporting people and kind of what it means to be a peer support volunteer with us? Um, yes, I can, Rob. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me fine. Um, I mean, going back to 2014, that's when I um, joined as a, as a volunteer with Muscular Dystrophy UK. Um, I think initially it was as a, as a um, advocacy ambassador which did progress into a peer support role. Um, and I think initially, you know, I, I, did, I did a couple of visits to local people um, who hadn't, who suffered from Beckham muscular dystrophy. Um, again, I also did a few phone calls, emails, um, and, you know, that were quite, really just talking about specific conditions, um, how Beckham is progressive, how other people have dealt with it and you know different ages people younger people older um some people who were um you know in wheelchairs some people who were still walking struggling um and i think you know they found that maybe interesting but i did as well um and i think that's you know one of the good things about being a, um, a peer support is that you know you are providing um maybe information to a people but it's it's a sort of two-way process um and i think you know obviously not just specific conditions but you know a couple of the things that we spoke about were what maybe i've in recent years had experience of is is pip um and i think you know the the if we can just stress on really a couple of points which which i find and i think other people with the condition as as, as well i've i've um you know, I've, I've come across um, is, you know, the, the progressive nature of a condition, um, you know, for instance, when I was younger and, and other people with a condition, you know, what, what you experience maybe in your 20s is totally different to what you experience in your 30s and your 40s from, yeah, I mean, you know, from my 
perception, you know, when I was younger, there were certain things I could do, but I had a lot of pain through cramps, etc. cetera. Um, nowadays, it's just the inability to, to do certain things. Um, you know, so that that's something what needs to come across on the PIP application. Um, the other big, I think, issue about PIP is, is you are, you're having to focus on the negative, um, which <laughs> is very difficult. Um, you know, you kind of, if you have a stumble or a fall, I think you kind of, you know, really, you want to put to the back of your mind and maybe just have a laugh at the time and, and just get on with it. Not, you know, have to write it down and, and, and you know, have to, you know, think about that issue. Again, you know, we, we, we do, I think, for our, just not for our maybe physical health, but also for our mental well-being as well, we, we, we do need to focus on the positives in life especially when you've got a progressive condition. And, you know, when you're going through the PIP process, that can be very difficult. Um, but I think, you know, what I've said to, you know, people when, when we, I've spoke about PIP is, you know, it's, it, again, I think what Beth covered is it's essential to, you know, back up letters, you know, what you get maybe from your ne neurologist, letters from, um, you know, people with muscular dystrophy who can tell them about specific conditions, um also about notes you know maybe keeping a diary um it, it can be can be a bind to do that but yeah it, it, it's basically telling the story you know when you're meeting up with these people when you are actually being assessed um i think you know the other issue i think what a lot of people find is obviously certainly with the mobility aspect um to get them full points you know, there's that, you know, sort of 20 metre rule. And I think people can, it's easy to say, well, yeah, you know, on a good day, I can go out, I can walk more than 20 metres. But I think, you know, it's, 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 you know, when you're explaining to people that it's obviously about doing something, you know, repeatedly and safely, and also sort of on a, on a timely manner. And, you know, having maybe one day when you just can't, you know, when you're struggling to get up in the morning and some days when you just, you know, through them physical struggles, then, you know, the mental side comes in that, you know, you sometimes just can't be really bothered. Um, and, you know, from my perception, it's putting them views across and, and as a peer support, someone else with that specific condition is sitting down and saying, you know, well, I've, I have this condition as well and, and I may have it more advanced. It may be not as advanced as yours. Um, but again, it's something that with it being progressive, you know, obviously, you know, you've got to go back in a few more years and say, well, this is how it's affecting me now. Obviously, with a progressive disability, <laughs> you know, unless some miracle drug, drug comes about, um, you know, you, you're not going to be, you know, you, you've got to be getting progressively worse. So it's, you know, I think, again, you know, the, the, the peer support helps um, in the sense that, you know, you're talking to other people who have a similar condition as yourself. Thanks, Mark. That was that was brilliant. I think kind of two elements you pulled out there really um, sort of rang, home, rang true for me. One is that sort of the, the contradiction that in your PIP, thought form you have to sort of think about your worst day when actually yeah as you say trying to kind of um live well with the condition means you you you, you try not to dwell on those worst days and, and that and that can lead to issues and i think as well the issue that you've highlighted that we're not just here to help with the sort of practical side of the of, of these kind of processes but yeah that peer support literally just having someone who's gone through something similar to share experiences and, and get support from i think is, is really important so so thank you very much mark um We've, oh, we've got some great questions coming through. So the, the first one um, we'll look at is, is access to work. So someone's asked in the Q&A whether we will cover access to work or we, we do cover access to work. So yeah, access to work is a scheme that's there to help um, people um, secure adjustments that their employer um, either isn't um, bound to make or doesn't have to make or, um, or can't afford to. We had a seminar on this issue, on the issue of employment a couple of weeks ago. So I'd urge people to... Um, jump on and look at that because we were actually joined by someone from the DWP who was talking specifically about the access to work scheme 
um, but we can we do come through to the helpline. And, and Beth, I think you you you've said that we that's something we can help people just to advise them how to access the scheme and kind of what they need to do. Yeah, definitely, it's something that we do advise on. Um, it's it's a topic that comes up quite a lot through the helpline, um, and it is good. You have to apply yourself, so your employer can't apply for you. Um, but it is through the government um, and it's just quite a good scheme in, if your employer kind of has fulfilled all of the reasonable adjustments. Um, if you need any like specialist software, um, any adapted equipment such as like chairs or desks, um, if you need like a taxi journey to and from work, if you're unable to use public transport, um, then it can all be funded through that scheme. Um, so it's definitely a good scheme to look at if you're in employment and you need a little, little bit of additional support. Brilliant. Thank you, Beth. Um, we've had a couple of questions specifically on ESA. So Jackie, um, I'm, I'm going to quite enjoy this, this next 20 minutes of putting individuals on the spot as we go through these questions. But the, the specifics on ESA is, is ESA a means tested benefit? And does it make a difference if you're currently in work or not when claiming for ESA? I think Jack is just trying to unmute, I think. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, so... Um, depending on what type of ESA you're eligible for, it can be means tested. Um, so income related ESA is means tested, whereas my understanding is new style ESA and contributions based isn't means tested. Um, but there's lots of conditions attached to when and where you can apply for. Um, and the other question um, about being in work, so you, you can be in work. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in or out of work when you apply for ESA. Um, but to be eligible for it, I believe you're only able to work up to 16 hours a week and earn no more than £140 a week as well. Um, so again, it, it's dependent on each individual situation. So, Great. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we've had some, a question about, about PIP and the, and the pension age. Um, so can, we, can you receive PIP um, and the national state pension at the same time? I think, um, Beth, is that one for you? I think, or Neera, you've come off mute quickly. I can do that one, hence I've come off mute. Um, if you're already in receipt of PIP, that will continue as you turn state pension age. If you have a new application, then you would apply for something called attendance allowance. We haven't gone into detail about that today, but you can contact us about that and we'd be happy to support you with attendance allowance as well. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had an a, good, a good question from a, actually a neuromuscular physio about how to kind of refer people um, to us. And that's something we, we do do. So, um, Neil, sorry to pick on you again, but what would the process be if, if um, a care advisor or a physio or indeed any other clinician thought someone could benefit from our support, but maybe wanted to contact us directly rather than ask, the, ask their patients to do that? So as long as the patient has given you any consent, so either verbal or written consent, you can contact us about them. If they've given you consent to provide their details, you can pass on those details to us. And then we will give them an initial call, which is like a helpline call coming through to us. And then going forward, if we need to support them with anything, we'd send them a consent form. So there's no issue with referring people across to us. And some people do find it difficult to contact us directly themselves. Um, even last week, I had an individual on the phone with a healthcare professional. So we spoke to them at the same time. And I think it's just once they know what we can support them with, they're a bit more confident. Thank you. Um, um, I think this, this is, well, I think for, for Beth and Mark in the first instance, a really, a really Good question. I think I think a very common experience. Someone who's um, been on DLA for twenty years and is worried about moving over to PIP um, because it, it it seems like quite a daunting process and and lots of scare, scary stories about it. I think that's very common, isn't it, Beth? In terms of people being a bit daunted by the process and and kind of exactly exactly why we're here, I guess, for, to help people with PIP. Yeah, definitely. I mean, transferring over from DLA to PIP is not a nice thing to do because I suppose when you're awarded with DLA. You know, you, you don't think you're going to have to apply for a new benefit. So it's really unfortunate that it, it has been phased out for adults. Um, and I know a lot of people we speak to is like the dreaded brown envelope when they receive the envelope to ask them to transfer. But um, I would say, you know, we this is why we're here um, to ease those concerns, to support you right from the beginning of the process and to make sure you get what you're entitled to. 
Um, and, you know, sometimes if people don't get what they are entitled to from the first initial application, um, obviously I know it's not ideal challenging it and it is a long process, but we will be there every step of the way to help you challenge it. And, you know, we will just make sure people do get what they are entitled to. So if you're on DLA and you're receiving the higher rates, then you should be receiving the higher rates on PIP. Um, and we will help as best as we can to get those higher rates for you. Great, thank you. And and, and Mark, what well, that must be quite common then. People sort of feeling a bit nervous about the process. And, and what what how do people sort of talk about their feelings about the PIP process when 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 they sort of talk to you? I think you know again, it's it is quite understandable how how people do feel. Um, <laughs> I think people, you know, maybe as well, you, you sometimes self-doubt yourself. Um, and, you know, it, it's very overwhelming when, when you read, um, you know, maybe some of the guidelines and you think, well, you know, do I have this condition? And, and um, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm just trying to explain really how, how maybe seeing if of the people who I, who, I, who I have spoken to but I think really, you know, it's, it's a progression and, and I think, you know, the, um, you know, particularly on the motability aspect um, about this, you know, the sort of walking rule um, and, and, you know, when, when they open up and speak about it, it, it's easy to talk about it, but it's getting it down in writing. Um, what I would advise as well is, is, you know, if you're not, you know, if you're not confident on filling all the forms in yourself, you know, obviously, contact muscular dystrophy, UK, you know, I mean, you know, I, they can help, but also contact your local authority, um, you know, speak to your, um, you know, community benefits and rights department or, you know, wh whatever they're called, but, you know, they, they do have customer service advisors, uh, advisors who will sit down with you and will go through some of your forms. There's also the... Um, you like occupational um, health advisors, you know, working the adult social care or, you know, children's social care departments. Again, you know, they can um, they can go through it with you and, and, and sit down because um, at the end of the day, it's sometimes sitting down with someone and, and say, you know, reading this question out and say, well, how does it affect you? And not particularly, you know, you might have a day where you think, well, today, you know, I can do that activity, but tomorrow or a day when, when I feel fatigued, um, I may not have to do that. So, again, it's about maybe constantly having a diary, writing little aspects down um, and just, again, referring to them. I, I don't know if that's of help. Um, yes, Mark. Thank you. That was fantastic. They're really, really helpful advice. And then a sort of follow-up question, I think, um, one for you, I think, Beth, is just, does the if you if someone's on DLA, does it stop when they start the application process for PIP, or is there a kind of period where you, where you, where you sort of are still receiving something? Yeah, no, your DLA won't stop. Um, so when you're asked to make an application for PIP, um, you've got four weeks to start your PIP claim, um, and then your DLA will be kept on being paid um, until your PIP claim has been decided. Um, so then, um, so yeah, so you won't lose out on any money. So yeah. Great, thank you. And then, well, I've got you, Beth. Um, and a final sort of PIP question, which is about the uh, the appeals decision. And I, I, I think you've got a figure for how many people are successful in appeals. The question was how many PIP appeals are successful. Before you give us the sort of the figure you've got, I, I quickly checked the report I mentioned, which I gave the wrong name for. So, so our, our report's called Below Standard. So, so still, still a bit of a leading report title, but um, and in that report, which was the experience of a. Um, around 600 people living with a muscle wasting condition, over half of respondents who went through the appeals process um, obtained an overturned decision. And actually that, that's below the average, I think, isn't it, Beth? Because you've, you've, you've found a figure for that. So what, what is the likelihood of success if you do go through the, the PIP sort of appeal process? Um, so I think um, it's around 70% of PIP and ESA appeals um, are successful. Um, so that's at the tribunal stage. So as Jackie said earlier, it's obviously external from the DWP, it's a judge. Um, so yeah, it is a very high success rate, 70%. So it just kind of uh, goes to show um, how the DWP are making kind of wrong decisions about people's benefits. Um, so we would always really encourage someone to go to tribunal 
um, because more you know more than likely you will get what you're entitled to, and they will overturn the DWP's decision. Great, thanks, Beth. Um, we've got about sort of four or five minutes left, and we've got one question left. So as we as we answer this question, um, I, I, if, if there are any final questions, do um, do type them into the to the Q and A function. But this one's about universal credit. So Jackie, can I come to you first? The question is around sort of savings limits and potentially sort of pension pot around um, accessing universal credit. What, what what are the rules about that? Yeah, so um, how you use your pension pot can affect your benefits, um, any benefits that you receive or your eligibility to claim a benefit. Um, and the reason for that is because withdrawals or investments may be counted as income or capital, um, which affects a means tested benefit. Um, and in terms of any pensions is a really complex area as well. So if there's anything specific to do with that, then give us a wee call and we can chat through individual circumstances. Um, yeah, <laughs> just to add to that, in terms of pensions and the complications of universal credit, we can also signpost to organisations that are specialists in that area as well. So even if, like I say, we can't help you, we can signpost you to somebody that can. Great. Thanks, everyone. We've that that sort of um, we've had some fantastic questions, and I think thank you to to Beth, Neary, Jackie, particularly Mark as one of our volunteers for giving up your time to be with us th this morning. Thank you so much. Um, all, all of that information is is available direct through the helpline, so do get in touch if you if you have any questions, and you, you you'll speak to one of the the team, or we can respond via email. Um, I think the only thing left for me to do is just to highlight to remind people that we are the recording of this will be available um, over the next sort of few days. Um, to thank you very much for joining us this morning and, and, and particularly those who've put forward questions which has been um which has been great we've just had a follow-up question coming in um so is is, is it too and it, and it may this may be too sort of um too complex on pick in the three minutes you have left but is it fair to say that if you have 16k or above in savings you can't get benefits is that is that too simplistic a way of of, of saying it is it a bit, a bit more complex do we think it it can depend on each um, each different benefit. So some benefits can be as low as six thousand, and others are, are sixteen thousand. But I think sixteen thousand is a kind of general line. But again, it's unique to each situation. So great. And um, with things like care packages, social care packages, savings will be taken into account as well. And then we did say we're continuing health care. They won't. We didn't go into detail about that, but it is sort of financial related as well. So I would just get in touch with us with further questions. Brilliant. Well, thanks, everyone. So um, the final thing for me to say is that, we're, like I said, there are two now. When, when we embarked on these, these seminar series back in August, it, it, sort of, it was beautiful, long, sunny days. But now we've got two left to go and we're heading into, into autumn. But do, do, do join us for the... The final session if you wish to in a couple of weeks time and, and do look at the sessions we've had already and um, you'll, you'll receive an email after this session with a short feedback form we really fantastic if you could take part in that because we're very keen to um, develop these further and if we do them again in the future and um, take on board your experiences I do hope you've um, enjoyed the session and found it of, of use and um, do get in touch with the, the helpline and we can either help you directly or put you in touch with one of our fantastic peer support volunteers like Mark um, Mark, we may get some named requests for you, I think, after this. So thank you very much. Um, so do do have a good, in, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, thanks for joining us and take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.